Good afternoon, friends. I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and I have a very special uh, guest and brother that is joining me today uh, via telephone hookup, uh, Brother Robert. And Brother Robert, you are you out in California, or what state are you in? Yes, I'm in Orange County, California. Orange County, California. I'm actually in Orange County, Florida. <laughs> At any rate, though, uh, Brother Robert, Robert I know. yes, he has agreed to join us uh, this evening to discuss uh, uh, his involvement or, or, or his opportunity, I should say, in being able to review the, the, the notes of the late Chilean astronomer uh, Farada. And uh, I think it's a marvelous time to get to listen to some of the things he's got to say. Uh, and uh, to give you a little bit about his background, we'll have uh, Robert to share that with you. And, uh, and to discuss uh, Herboculus, which is the, as uh, Farada, the Chilean astronomer, had described this, a planet comet that would be coming our way uh, that also would have a tail uh, that would cause tremendous destruction to the earth. And uh, so he wrote me, I think, I think even the, the, uh, the, the, the way our coming together was kind of interesting to begin with because I, have, I get so many thousands of emails and uh, I just felt really impressed on my heart recently to go in there and look and run the word asteroids in there because I feel like somebody was writing on it. And of course, you know, naturally, thousands of people are writing, but uh, I, Robert's email seemed to just catch my eye. So I opened his email and I began to read it, and it really caught my attention. And so we, I touched base with him that same day, and uh, so the kind of the rest is history. So I'm going to turn this over to Brother Robert a little bit uh, to talk to you a little bit, tell you about his background, and then how he came to be able to view these. Uh, amazing notes by the Chilean astronomer, uh, Mr. Ferrada. Robert, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I am a very uh, strong believing and deep faith Christian, and that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and the Lord God created everything that we have. And I spent uh, just under six years in the United States Navy, uh, I was a cryptographic technician in Kirkland. Uh I was at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California for two years. Uh, Spanish, and then I did also did a little bit of Arabic Egyptian. But my main, main language was Spanish. And then after that, went on to do a few things that I still can't discuss today, but with some uh, special ops teams as their interpreter. And uh, got out. And I've always had a very uh, deep fascination with the firmament, what the Bible has to say about it, and uh, the uh, Carlos Munoz Parada and his work through all those years. I was just so deeply, deeply fascinated with it that back in 1991, uh, back before there was a lot of cell phones or, or and, uh, internet, uh, I started researching as best I could, and there's some uh, university people in Mexico, uh, they were able to get me in contact with the, uh, some of the people that had worked with uh, Senor Ferrada, and I traveled to uh, Chile, and I spent three days going over, not everything, but a lot of the stronger documents, and his work charts, and calculations, and uh, it was just such a blessing, it, it took my heart and my mind at the same time, and I was so grateful. And uh, it also uh, explained a lot of things that I books that people have written and stuff that I come across. And I got it directly from the man. And uh, it, most people, are, they got bits and pieces of it. And I'm not saying that I've got the whole picture. In fact, after speaking with Steve the other day, I teached back out to my contacts in Mexico, of which one of them is still living, and I asked him to see who was now in charge of that possession of uh, Chinook Parada's uh, belongings.
needs and work stuff and charts and to see if there would be an opportunity if I could get some of that stuff emailed to me now. It's been great in a few years. So I'm waiting for that answer. And, uh, but Steve, why don't you go ahead and if you, whatever questions you've got, good with them, or if I've got the answer or some of it, I'll, I'll speak on it. Well, yeah, absolutely, Robert, because I know what's really on a lot of people's minds right now is what what did Ferrata write when it came to uh, uh, the Herculeus system? Uh, most people look at this and they call it Planet X or Nibiru. Uh, I know that he called it a, uh, I don't know if he referred to it as a binary system, but if we could just first kind of outline what he was looking at that was coming because probably like yourself I saw the interview that he did right before he passed away uh, and I forget what year that was but uh, the, the Chilean uh, media interviewed him and uh, he had already been very successful in predicting earthquakes and things like that based on uh, stellar movement and then he was finally revealing about this uh, planet comet that was coming with a uh, elliptical orbit and yes. and how it would be devastating. If you can kind of give us a little summary of what you know about from his notes, how he wrote about that, and then we'll go move on to after that, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the timing that you saw in his, in his notes. Okay. Well, let me first state, like I told you the other night, Steve, uh, he had, had viewed this uh, planet, comet, uh, way out in space, and it was, you know, inbound, I'll call it inbound, but it would accelerate and decelerate, which was very uh, surprising to him. In his writing, he would write uh, in Spanish, me sorprendido mucho de aceleración, de aceleración, and he was very puzzled by that. Uh, and then he did some more calculations and then further into the paperwork where he would pass uh, way out of, uh, way, way out, uh, other bodies beyond our, our planet system. And, and he figured out that whatever we get, I'm not, I'm not a professional, this is, yes, excuse me how I'm talking. It's okay. He would, when he would get closer to, to a, a, a planetary body, it would be tapped, it pulled, slowed down, and then as it passed that area, it would accelerate again. And his estimation originally, which Steve, I think you mentioned the other night, was something around it when he was 2010. But right before he passed away, he redid those calculations and wrote in the notes that in the latter part of 2020, which is the year we're in, year of our Lord, 2020, that we would start to see uh, very small pieces and fragments of, see, this is the strange thing. It not only has a tail, it's got a forward barrier of roots and small objects that are traveling with it, and it would start to strike the Earth. But nothing that would be a planet killer or a uh, extinction level event or anything like that. And then... Uh, and that's where it, well, I got to that point, and, uh, and that's where uh, I'll leave it at that for right now. And then you, what else do you want to ask me, and we'll keep it. Well, I think that's important, too, for people that are listening, because, uh, you know, the, with, with the sources that I have, both in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Pentagon, and as well, uh, one uh, particular individual who is a, a FEMA engineer, they have all been saying about uh, that. Well, let me let me start first with uh, with my wa uh, White House source. He he claimed that come September, that nobody on this planet would or, or everybody on the planet would know that we are in serious trouble. But my White House source, who's an advisor to the President of the United States, he never said what it was that we would see, that we would know that we're in serious trouble. Later, uh, what the source that I have with FEMA, who's an engineer there, 
uh, was saying that we would begin to be hit by uh, meteorites or, or asteroids, uh, that, but it would be slow in the beginning. Slow, you'd be get one here and there that would start hitting the Earth, and that that would be what people realize that we've got trouble on the way. And then my Pentagon friends that are, that are contractors for the Pentagon that speak with the generals directly have stated to me that one of the rocks would end up hitting a populated city and that it would be a mass loss of, you know, be a loss of life from the impact. And that would be what would cause the people to realize that we're in trouble. So with that information there, Robert, kind of give us an idea of what you have, may have seen in your notes regarding this year of 2020 and what his predictions were. One second, Robert. <laughs> Hang on one second, Robert. For some reason, you're breaking up. Let's let's try it again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I hear you. Now you're clear. Go ahead. Okay. I don't know what you Basically, you Yeah, it was, it was losing you there for a second, but let me just ask you this, because one of the things that I was told by my FEMA contact is that they anticipated that besides the, the, the rocks that would hit some of the singular rocks, that we would end up having, uh, and this would be towards the end of the year going into next year, we would have what they called showers of meteorites. And it would come like a storm almost, that it would just come down, hundreds of them would come down. Uh, and that that would come in waves, uh, that it wouldn't happen all at once, but you get a wave here, and then that would stop, and then would come another wave of them. Uh, I've also been told by the friends that are contractors for the Pentagon that, uh, that we would see that as well. But they spoke about it being that they could be the size of basketballs coming down. How would you relate okay. any of your evidence on okay. this? Okay, Ferrata so spoke about the possibility of the sizes of it and the incoming into the atmosphere of Earth and coming through whatever barriers there are, that we could end up with things as small as marbles to the size of large. Uh, he used the term, uh, the balls that you use when you work out the balls that weigh like 30 pounds and you toss them back and forth. Uh, he used that as a descriptive word. Uh, that's larger than a basketball. Yes. And then, about that, and then as it went through, it, it, it's almost what you're being told. The same thing. As the end of the year progressed and the beginning of next year, it would be a a very inordinate number where that would be what people would say, my goodness, you know, 30, 40 of them came in in one day. And and then they would be like, we must be, like you said, people the light bulb would go on and they'd say, well, this is not normal and we must be in real trouble. And then out of all those that would be 
coming inbound, according to his writing, there would be at times larger ones, and he never said about one hitting a major populated city or area, but he said it would be extremely life-threatening. And that's what he wrote, and it was kind of an open statement. And I even a couple of the people there to make sure I was reading my Spanish correctly. They said, yes, that's what he wrote, and you're reading it correctly. So there are things coming inbound that would be life-threatening. And that's the way he left it on that note, on that particular subject that he was writing on. And it would accelerate and become more and more and more. And then one point that he said, at a point, other observatories throughout the world would not be able to deny any further, that was his word, they could not deny any further that there was something coming inbound, a large planetary slash comet, because all the observatories would be able to see it by the beginning of 2021, and then after that, there would be so much inbound fragments coming in that the general everyday public they would just, they would know. They will know, and they will be like, how long have you people known about this? And again, what your one resource told you, what the separate resource told me, was the thing that under Carter was set up was when they discovered this thing. And it was also during the time that Burrata was doing all of his research. That's how long they've known about this, at least back to the late 70s. Wow. I, and I have heard that even going back into the 60s, they were already uh, speculating uh, this coming in. Uh, but like you said, too, the 70s is another time frame as well. Now, I know that Ferrado, when I watched uh, the, the, docu or the television broadcast where they had him in, uh, they, they focused a lot on where he could predict earthquakes and things like that, weather events based on... Uh, moving celestial bodies. Does did, did you see anything in his notes where he talked about radical changes in the weather uh, from this incoming system? Yes, uh, weather changes, uh, the uh, the movement of tectonic plates would happen, the earthquakes, uh, mainly a lot of very strange and unusual weather changes to the point where, uh, and now I'm using my words right now, so this is not for a lot of words. Okay. And what I got out of it was this. We would be able to witness weather patterns that were not normal, like uh, 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 tornadoes out in the ocean and all of that kind of stuff. And... Uh, we're, we're, we're like cyclones would go on in, in the Southeast Asian area of the world and all that stuff. We would start seeing those occurring in Central and South America, cyclones, and big ones, and very devastating. And that would be in 2021. Wow. And this is something that uh, Glenn originally told me was that... Uh, we would, uh, that would be one of the major factors that we would see in the beginning would be radical weather changes, increased activity in earthquakes, volcanoes uh, erupting. Uh, then we would go into storms like never before. We would see, at, at one point, it would finally get to a place where we would see winds on the earth at 200 miles an hour. Uh, and just unimaginable. Why did record any miles or hours? He didn't call it mile per hour, but he said there would be winds and weather changes that we have never seen before or ever been recorded in any writings on the planet before. Wow. Wow. Just that in itself is quite quite frightening. Now, according to our, our FEMA source, and I know Ferrada did speak about this because you're also mentioning how he talked about uh, the tectonic plates moving, but our my FEMA source uh, spoke about how that the Earth would be ripped at the seams. That uh, when when the actual main celestial body comes in, that because it's an iron-based comet, that it will have a major effect on the gravitation of the Earth, and that literally 
it will cause continents to divide. Does he speak any of this in the writings or record this in his writings? Okay, what I read, he did not speak to the, to the point of continents ripping apart, but he said that because of the gravitational pull and the changing in the uh, power of magnitude or the magnetism of Earth to change so radically that it would be a, a very sure possibility that that could happen. Wow. Now, I do know one thing that I found interesting, Robert, was that uh, what you had shared with me was the time frame is more drawn out in Farada's writings than what I'm being told now. Uh, you know, I was told that things would happen and they would escalate and that around March, April next year, we would be at the climax point. But from what I understand and the notes that you had, uh, were able to see that this time frame would be drawn out much further and the events spread out much further as well to where it would not be as devastating in the beginning until actually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, several years later. Yes, but remember, he constantly rewrote uh, notes to himself and telling himself and anybody who's going to read anything of this in the future that these are only estimates. They cannot be done in an exact science at that time. And when he actually wrote and complained that he wished he had another 20 or 30 years of life that he believed that by that time he would be able to give a more accurate prediction of the time frame. And he did stretch it out to uh, 2020, like to to 2026, 2027, and I don't want to call it the, the, the pinnacle or the peak of it, but it would be at that point that the whole planet would be dealing with all these destructive forces going on, and, trying, and, there, and he said, there's no escaping it. He said, in his writing, he wrote, there is no escaping it's what is coming to this planet, no escaping. That's interesting as well, Robert. You know, I actually spoke with another uh, a source just recently uh, who for the Federal Emergency uh, uh, Management Agency uh, down in, I believe it's Texas, uh, shared with me that, uh, that they had uh, worked with a, a particular sheriff that knew quite a bit about this information and how that, uh, uh, that you know, in their preparations, I uh, actually lost my thought of what I was going to say on that. But but anyway, let me, let me move on then. The uh, I know that what you're saying that uh, Farada had wrote, that given this time frame between 2020, but roughly 2027, uh, I know my own source originally had said to me that they did think it was 2010 that this was going to come through, but they got their calculations wrong. And when we were coming up uh, earlier, I think around March of this year, when I first broke the story on knowing that they believed it's coming now, uh, he said that there were events that they could see that were making it more obvious that this time they're right on it. And that one of them was the, the ocean had risen four inches, uh, where now Miami was four inches underwater. And that... Uh, he even told me at that time, he said, in six months, I'll have a better idea of exactly when this is going to come through. But at that point, he was already saying roughly about 18 months. And he said anywhere from a year to 18 months out uh, that this this would actually come through. So uh, there and, and of course, and one uh, man that had met me in Kansas had given me a, this memory stick. He did like Parada. He had put a he had a lot of information in this in the on this memory stick, but in one particular part he had estimated it in his estimations 2023 roughly thereabout uh, we would begin to see this. And he talked about the debris field would come first, uh, like you're saying as well. But he mentioned something in his uh, in his notes that that debris field had been caused by a collision when it came came through many years ago uh, when it hit Jupiter, and that's what would cause that debris field. 
Do you see anything like that in these notes? No, nothing about that. Nope, not about that. Okay. But I did remember earlier in that conversation right now that, that it, it might be quite possible because when the Eucharist is coming through, uh, it would pass certain planetoids like Jupiter or others where it would slow down and then speed up, lose some of its debris field, and then have more debris field created because of that magnetism and that pull on it. And I, I wouldn't discount it, this guy. That's, you know, that's interesting. It happened, yeah. I don't know. That is very interesting because I, I can't help but think, Robert, uh, and you mentioned, like you said, it loses some of its debris field. And this is something that Glenn said to me as well, that uh, Jupiter, he said, kind of like a divine providence, uh, really shields the Earth from a lot of this. Uh, but there's something I'm curious to see if you've ever noticed this as well. Glenn said that one thing that they had not anticipated was the increased radiation that the Earth is absorbing because of what's coming, and therefore it was heating the core of the Earth up. Did you happen to run across anything similar to that? No, not from the heating up of the core of the Earth or radiation increases. Uh, not, not in the writings, but from the lot that I was allowed to be privy to read. Okay, and it may be because they're experiencing it now, and that's what he was saying. He said when they built the underground bunkers, they had never anticipated that particular aspect. Uh, and he said now the earth was heating up kind of like an egg boiling in water and beginning to crack. And that's what they were experiencing. And they were very fearful of going underground as a result of that. And uh, now I, I am curious about one other thing, and I won't hold you two more longer, Robert, and then we'll have to try to do this again in the future. Uh, but I've had a couple of the sources mention, a particular one, my FEMA engineer has spoken about, and didn't say why, but said that Miami, Orlando, Jacksonville, and uh, there's one other city, um, Savannah, Georgia, will all be totally destroyed. Now, I don't know if that's because of maybe an impact at sea. Uh, I know that my Washington source had mentioned before that they have the ability of tracking the larger rocks. So, I don't know if there's anything that he may have said as far as, well, you mentioned earlier he never spoke about any specific cities being hit or anything. Uh, does he talk about anything hitting the oceans? Oh, yeah. He, of course, he said that, that it would come to a point where there would be so many inbound coming inbound that they would be hitting in the ocean. And uh, he said that this is one calculation that he had that was a little bit more refined, but in his estimation and on the side or the angle that it would be at at that point with the debris field coming in, that the larger pieces would be hitting the ocean area rather than the land masses. So that's one thing I went back and checked on through my notes. So, wow. yes, yeah, tsunami and things like that, that's why we were getting that information is from uh, open ocean impacts of larger asteroids from the debris field and then tsunami activity. Well, you know, there was, uh, and, and I'm curious about this as well, Robert, I know that my own source said that like uh, Israel, Syria, not, not the coast of Israel, but uh, the interior of Israel, Syria, and uh, also... Um, uh, parts of China and middle of Africa would actually be spared a lot of this. And I don't know why that is, but he said the United States would really be devastated. He said almost like an extinction level event. Uh, but interestingly enough, even when it comes to Israel, uh, Gil Broussard had sent me a, a, a photograph today that had showed that the coastlines of Israel used to be further inland. 
Uh, and I know he also is anticipating that this is going to come through starting this year and heavily impact us by next year. Any any thoughts on those issues? Okay, wait. You just said that the coastline of Israel used to be further inland? Yeah, that was something that Gil Broussard sent to me. And, of course, I was told that... Uh, when uh, this all happens, that the coastline of Israel will be heavily impacted by tidal waves, uh, but not not like when you go up into the mountains, all that area would be safe. That Israel, for the most part, is a safe zone because of the way the Mediterranean is sitting. It's harder for big waves to come in like that, uh, but northern Africa would be destroyed, and also like Tel Aviv, uh, Haifa, uh, Ashkelon, those cities there would also be destroyed uh, when this thing comes through. And that would down to the uh, debris, the comets coming in, or asteroids coming in, or because of a tsunami? That's supposed to be because of a pole shift that will create a tsunami that when we actually go through the pole shift itself, and I guess that's when Herboculus is actually passing between the sun and the earth. That's what I was told. When it passes between the sun and the earth, uh, which, you know, it'd be a long way out. It would, probably wouldn't look that big to us. But nonetheless, as it passes through there, they, uh, I was told that we would have two things would happen. The magnetosphere would collapse and that the earth would take a sudden jolt. And when it does, it'll begin to shift for a space i want to say i was told six hours by one source and i think two hours by the other okay well now i've heard things like that when i was doing all this research a long time ago similar things about when when the brokenness was between the sun and us almost the same thing that you just said that the jolt and the and the, and the angle change like you said, would happen like that. But remember, at that point, there won't be any place on planet Earth that you're going to be that you will be able to see the brokenness with the naked eye. At that point, there will be no hiding it, no hiding the debris field. They can't come up with any BS story. It is going to be what it is. And uh, also, addressing what you said a moment ago about the uh, underground bunkers. I have also heard from people through a couple of sources recently, the last few months, that they are now really second. I didn't say why, but they're really buried because of the deal, the bounce that they built for whatever is going on in the inside of the earth, that they don't believe it's going to be that much of a very a good protection or. One moment, guys. We got you. We got you blank just for a minute, Robert. We st it stopped on us right when you said that it won't be good protection inside. They built. Okay. That they may not be as protective as they thought. Exactly, uh, Robert. I will tell you what. Yeah. Listen, I I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss these things, Robert. And uh, I do want to bring you back on again very soon. Uh, to discuss these things and listen those of you that are listening in on this broadcast here uh, I appreciate Robert because he's just an honest brother he's a believer uh, and I really appreciate him tremendously being willing to share this information and of course like myself he just wants to know the truth and uh, and I think too it also gives us uh, maybe it helps even calm people a little bit more because the way I've been told thus far, it seems like that things will get really drastic, uh, you know, sometime in September and getting only worse by the end of the year. But some, from some of the notes that uh, Robert has been able to view, uh, it looks like it could start, of course, this year, but maybe not be as drastic as what we have been uh, informed that it could, excuse me, that it could be. So I think that gives people a little bit more comfort zone in hearing that. 
Uh, but at the same time, my desire is, is that we are prayed up and that our hearts are right with the Lord Jesus because we are certainly living in the last days. And, uh, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, you know, there's no way we, we, I mean, when it comes to falling rocks, it, that's only God's grace wherever we are at at that time. That's not going to matter. Uh, even if you're here in Florida, you know, I just don't want to be here with their stupid COVID virus laws and regulations. I want to be somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. I feel a bit better by that, of course, with 5G. But when it comes to these rocks, that's only the mercy of God wherever we're at the time. But quite frankly, you know, I look at it this way, too. If a rock comes falling down out of the sky, some meteorite happens to land on your house, we'll just go meet Jesus that much sooner because I don't even think you'd feel it. That's right, and that's what I was going to tell people. If this gives people a little bit more calm and a little bit more reserve about what's coming, that's what my goal was. And also remember, the number one thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And say up to Him every day and seek Him out, and He will be there for you, and He will calm you and, and pray His love all over you, and you will feel peace, and you will be all right. And when this does come and it's all over, you will be with your brother, Jesus Christ, in heaven with the Lord. Amen, Brother Robert. That's so true. So very true. So thank you, Brother Robert, for, for coming in on with us today. And uh, next time we have Robert on, we're going to try to do this by by uh, by using the Internet there. We get a little bit better quality uh, on the audio there. But I think you should be able to hear this okay. And uh, if not, go back and listen to it a second time. If for some reason it's harder for you guys to understand, let me know. And I'll go back and we'll add subtitles to the video as well. Thank you for watching and God bless you all. Brother Robert, any last words? Just no, no, nothing other than thank you, Steve Rattin I'm going to be getting some more information in the in your near future. And uh, we'll get back together on this. Just put that on top. And uh, and thank you so much, and I pray for you and Jonna, and you guys do a great job. You guys are such wonderful Christians in, in the walk and everything you do. And again, thank you very much, okay? Thank you, my brother, as well. God bless all of you. Thank you for watching this evening, Israeli News Live.